So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today um, Dr. Shelley Jones, who is a very close colleague of mine um, and somebody um, who you've read some work from the book that um, she just put out uh, on Critical Role, uh, actual live streaming Critical Role. And um, it, this was a book that's been in development since um, I think 2017, 2018. So. So way on the like academic publishing moves slow. So the fact that Dr. Jones was on the critical role train before they became a big thing, picking up finding the best scholars in the world to write about them for her book is really an amazing thing. And um, I was really excited to extend that essay because I, I think this work really deserves to sort of exposure from folks like you who are out there doing great work and thinking about what it means to be live streaming, what it means to be playing role playing games and a bunch of different other things. Uh, Dr. Jones is also one of the my co-editors on the Analog Game Studies editorial board. Um, we work really closely together there, um, where she is an absolute wonder um, at editing essays and keeping everybody sane um, uh, while I'm a total disorganized mess. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to that, um, Dr. Jones has written many really amazing essays on uh, Dungeons and Dragons module questioning things like accessibility and mental health, and also in board games, questioning the use, the repeated use from a feminist standpoint of the use of male pronouns in rule books, right? Like why that's the default and not um, a more inclusive stance. Uh, so anyways, Dr. Jones is just this amazing role-playing game scholar. I'm so happy to have her there here today. Talk to us both about live streaming, but also she was initially supposed to come in, talk next week to talk more about inclusivity. So, and this was deliberate because she works in both fields that she was kind of on the cusp. So both days really work well. Really happy to have you here today, Shelley. Um, and yeah, please, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, I don't, I, I hope I live up to such an amazing introduction. Um, I guess, I guess I've done all of that. Um, thank you all for having me here. Um, uh, so yeah, the book um, is thankfully now out. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, Dr. Trammell told me that you were all reading some of it, which is awesome. Um, it was, it has been academic publishing takes a really long time for whatever reason. So uh, yeah, the initiation for that book had been when we all went to Gen Con and uh, um, actual uh, analog game studies had been up for the Diana Jones Award. We all uh, went and, and and ended up the actual play won that year for the award, um, which wasn't a huge surprise, but we still had our hopes up. <laughs> um, but when in that moment, uh, when actual play was winning, you know, this this major industry award, um, albeit a strange one, <laughs> um, we you know it kind of occurred that no, this is something this is something that needs academic attention. Um, and so that's kind of the, that was the, you know, behind the scenes impetus for the, for the book. Um, so I want to talk to you all today um, kind of about that more. Uh, I also don't want this to just be the, you know, sage on the stage or the queen on the screen, I guess is what we're going with <laughs> for, for modern things. Um, I don't want it to just be that. I'd love to hear, you know, some of what you all want to talk about as well. Um, so I'm going to set us up a little bit and then happy to open things up. Um, I have plenty to talk about, uh, um, but I also, you know, want to be, I would rather have a conversation as opposed to me just talking at you for, you know, an hour. Um, so, you know, I definitely want to talk about um, actual play and maybe even more specifically critical role fandom. Um, but I also just wanted to take a moment to kind of talk a little bit about the importance of that, the identity of um, the ACA fan, the academic fan. Um, so academics who actually, whose objects of study are fandoms or IPs within a fandom. Because um, I think sometimes when, that's a hard, it's a hard bridge uh, to cross um, because we are both fans of a sub of a of a of a IP or of a fandom. And often when I kind of critique or explore some of these fandoms or or D D specifically because of some gatekeeping and in, in that, um, people often must think that, oh, I, I must hate Dungeons and Dragons. And so then why am I wasting time, you know, critiquing them if I just hate this so much? And I don't. I love it. I love playing D. &D. I want to play more D. &D. <laughs> I enjoy it. 
I also recognize that maybe there's some issues sometimes. Um, and uh, only by, you know, acknowledging um, and admitting to those kinds of problems can we make something better. Um, so, but often people just think like, oh, you must, you know, you must hate the thing um, in order to be talking about it. But like, I would hope that we are actually in some sense, you know, interested in the things that we're writing about, interested in the things that we're spending ages and ages, you know, writing essays on. Um, so this ACA fan definition or, or uh, moniker um, is often attributed to Henry Dickens. Um, and so in his blog on the confessions of an ACA fan, he writes, you know, ACA has this snooty connotation, you know, that you've been trained to interpret and therefore you know better than the other people. Um, fans are immediately suspicious of this. The fan part of ACA fan has the connotation of unthinking, uncritical adoration. You're just so amazed and in love with it. And so academics are immediately suspicious, right? So this word has, is trying to, you know, it has this heavy load of trying to um, mitigate the, the disinterest of the scholar and the passion of the fan. But ultimately, uh, both of those parts of one's identity, you know, we're really just excited about the, the text. We love the text. And so we're just coming at it from different approaches. Um, and other scholars in the field who are kind of thinking about what it means to have this identity of the ACA fan um, are really just thinking about like, we're all engaged in a dialogue and a critique and a community around this text in some way. Um, and that being a fan of something, being the insider in the know, so to speak, helps us then get a better comprehensive picture of the fandom. So, um, but it is tricky sometimes when we're, when we're um, being a fan of something and also critiquing it and criticizing it because often those two things are kind of at odds. Um, but again, I would really hope that we are interested in the text that we're examining, because when you're genuinely interested in something that it makes your critique and observations stronger, right? Like, so my, aside from all the things that Dr. Trammell talked about that I do, I also, my, my day-to-day -day gig is I teach first year composition for the bulk of what I do, right? And so I'm, when I'm teaching my composition students, I'm always trying to encourage them to find a, a topic or a text that they're genuinely interested in. Because if because writing is hard enough as it is, and if you're then trying to write about something that you don't care about at all, it just makes it so much harder, right? So I would hope that we are writing about, um, and anger and rage can only get you so so far through a paper. <laughs> um, but you know, if we're writing about um, like uh, Dr. Trammell, when Dr. Trammell and I went to, uh, we're both at Binghamton University um, at various points in our careers. Uh, when I first got there, um, Dr. Trammell, I don't remember if you remember uh, Dr. Brinker Gabler, Gisela. Um, she was supposed to be my dissertation advisor and she wanted me to write about seventh, no, 18th century German opera. I did not care about seven, 18th century German opera. <laughs> it, I gave no craps about that. <laughs> it was her pet project. She wanted me to write about that. And I was like, I cannot write 300 pages about 18th century German opera. Um, it just wasn't gonna work. Like writing as hard enough as it is, that was not gonna happen. So um, I'm always you know, wanting my students um, to find, find the thing that they're passionate about because that will just make the writing so much easier. So. So then, so that's one part of it. But then being a fan of something is maybe a little different than necessarily just liking something, right? Because when we're a fan of something, it's much more immersive, it's much more identity building. It kind of becomes an expression of who we are and an expression of who we identify as, right? Because, um, so say the critical role fandom, right? right off the gate, they're critters, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Adriana Burton's back here, like, see my background? <laughs> see how wonderful? See how lovely? It is, it's lovely, <laughs> right? Um, so we, <laughs> right, it is a part of, it's a way for us to express who we are, which is awesome. Um, so then sometimes because it's a representation 
of a piece of us, then we're sometimes less wanting to criticize that because then maybe that's saying something else about us as well, right? So like um, sometimes maybe somebody wouldn't want to say that they're a D&D &D fan because, you know, D&D &D has its, has, well, Dr. Trammell has proven that, that it has, you know, uh, moments in white supremacy and other and roots in, in other problematic, you know, racist history. Um, so, but is that, you know, how, how do we kind of try to separate those things? And then how does that reflect who, who we are as fans of D&D &D or, or whatnot, right? So I did want to take a moment to kind of like think through that in itself, just because sometimes, um it's hard to acknowledge problematic things about the things that we love and we do we love them for a variety of reasons right um because and it's sometimes hard for us to try to kind of separate those things um but if we are you know burgeoning academics if we're at, you know trying to actually write an academic piece or an academic essay about any of the fun things that Dr. Trammell has been having you do for the last few weeks right it's important to kind of find that balance and uh, important to kind of take that step back from this is a super fun thing that I love and am passionate about and want to watch hours and hours of or play hours and hours of versus what else can I say about this what what do other people what would somebody not in the know think about this but then how can i take my positionality as a fan of it and deepen this conversation right so yes i absolutely watch lots of critical role i own way more critical role merchandise than i care to admit <laughs> i just like took off my critical role hoodie <laughs> um to like you know look presentable for y'all uh because it's 8 30 at night over here <laughs> um but um, so yeah, I just wanted to like, you know, think about that in terms of, um, you know, sometimes we're going to wrestle with what it means to, to, to be an ACA fan and what this identity is. And it's, I think it's important for us to, as you all are starting to write about the text that you've learned in Dr. Trammell's class, just think about that and take that, take that pause. Right. Okay. So besides Clearly, Adriana, who's right up on my screen. I'm sorry, I'm just, you know, a hundred of you or so, so I'm only not seeing everybody at once. Um, how many of you are critters out there? Just as a, you know, use the reaction button. Yeah. Some. Okay. Nope. Nope. A lot more popping up. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Yay. And lots of hearts. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Okay, cool. So um, I do want to talk a bit about that um, and think through um, some stuff that's happening there. And honestly, I'm going to be perfectly honest, the chapter that's in my, that's in my book that I wrote is maybe less um, critical of critical role and maybe more critical of the critical role fandom, but we'll, we'll <laughs> see how that goes. Um, so just out of curiosity, because I don't want to, again, talk for, you know, only be the one talking. What do you guys like about it? Can, can you either throw it in the chat or or are they allowed to unmute? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They can, okay, go. Cool. Um, yeah, they'll Again. often throw up their hands and then just go in, in order if you call on them. Okay, perfect. I love it. All right, Brandon. Okay, Gabriel. Uh, I'd say I'm mostly in it for the story and I'm also um big fan of the uh voice actors for their like voice acting talent mm -hmm. um so those two factors mostly the story and the acting awesome yeah and they do such a great job of all of that Erin um I think just in general um they do a really good job of making D&D &D seem really inviting and basically expanding the tabletop community in general and making sure that while they do that they're like very inclusive like trying to make characters that are like of even if they're all white like they try to bring in guest guards like guest stars like Robbie Damon and everything like that so I think they do a pretty good job in terms of just general inclusivity and such they are extremely conscientious about that which is good which is good um yeah and right and so all right so I'm I'm going to take notes just 
<laughs> the emphasis on the story, which there, you know, there's such like Matt Mercer does such an amazing job with all the, the lore in the background. And then you just know that there's somebody's going to bring up one thing and he's just going to dig through a pile of notes and he's, he knows exactly what that is. Um, uh, Kyle. Um, so the thing that I was going to say, um, is that, that like the story of critical role and like, or in all, all their campaigns is always really good. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of told in a unique way so like you know if you watch a movie or you play a video game or a book like there's normally like a laid out story like maybe in a video game you have different options you can go through but like watching the show it's anything could happen at any point in time because half the time they don't know what's happening and they're kind of going down the role play route of okay what are we doing next and it's very much so like anything could happen at any point in time which is like the fun of watching the show yeah, absolutely. That that impromptu nature of like, what's going to happen next? Is to, is today the day where they're going to, you know, go fight some crazy thing? Or are they going to have a four hour shopping episode? Anything could happen. <laughs> Matthew? Um, that's also kind of one of the reasons why I really like it. Um, I actually got into Critical Role from YouTube and just seeing all the, uh, like, animations people did for that and what drew me in was the humor the characters like I really just fell in love with like not just the story but also just the characters and all their different reactions and everything like the only piece of critical role merch I have is a t-shirt with all the characters faces on it and it's one of my favorite shirts okay. because it has like all my favorite characters from the stories in it awesome I love it yeah, they do do an excellent job. I mean, one, when you're sitting around for playing, they they do an amazing job of um, having very rich backstories that do actually come out, right? It's not just like, oh, this is my backstory on my character sheet that I'm hiding away and squirreling away and nobody knows about, right? They, they're because, partly because they are trained actors, right? They are able to kind of rely on that backstory and then tell much more immersive um, stories like that. Uh, Jeanette? Yeah, hi. So this might be a more like personal thing. Um, I actually got like into critical role through this class. Um, that isn't to say that I like didn't enjoy D and D like stuff beforehand. Um, but I did get into critical role specifically through this class. And something that I definitely enjoyed about it was just that it reminded me so much of watching my older brothers play video games when I was younger. And just that feeling of watching other people play and just like seeing what they're doing and just like kind of also feeling like you're a part of it. It's just something like it, it, it brings comfort, I guess. And I, I think that speaks for a lot of other people as well, especially like I'm kind of far from my family right now. So seeing uh, people play games like that, it brings me comfort in that kind of way. But also it's just funny. <laughs> I think the stories are funny. I think the interactions are funny and I enjoy watching, um, you know, like funny stuff. So the comedic um, importance <laughs> that they have in, um, critical role is like really something that I'm attracted to as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, one great job, Dr. Trammell, for getting them interested in critical <laughs> in this, but just through the class, you're know, like, I didn't know I did that, <laughs> but that's awesome. Um, you're creating, you know, more fans as we, as just by, just through the class. Um, but two, I think you're right, especially, maybe, maybe even especially in this day and age, like, yes, <laughs> good planning. Um, maybe especially in this day and age, we need that kind of comfort and the community um, because we aren't able to necessarily get it in, in other ways. And I, I do think it's interesting, like the, the watching other people play something, which is what, you know, this actual play and let's watch it plays and, and things like that are, are all about, is a kind of interesting phenomenon. But I liked the way um, you said that in terms of like, it reminds you of watching your your brother play, right? Like that's a thing we do, right? I remember being a little kid and watching my brother play Nintendo and really, really wanting to play um, Contra with him and constantly, you know, like having to fight over the controller. But for the most part, because he was ten years older, he was, you know, he he would play it and I would just sit and watch. Um, but there's a sense of community in that and and a ritual in that, right? Um, and and that's yes, <laughs> Contra is hard. <laughs> very hard 
that's the game where you secretly can get 40 guys and then I would still blow through the 40 guys because I was six and my brother was 16 <laughs> right um and then you could secretly steal a guy away from you know the other player and I accidentally did that a couple times because I didn't know what I was doing because I was six okay Avery <laughs> Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm not speaking for myself as the fan. It's one of my friends who's the fan. Um, and so he's the DM for our uh, our D&D group. And just on top of everything else that everyone else has said, just like the story and all the, you know, the people and all that, uh, he takes a lot of inspiration for our campaign from it. So I know that he likes to watch it because it helps him DM our campaign as well. That's really interesting. Um... I can absolutely see that. I there's also this uh, issue of like the Mercer effect, where people are so intimidated by how amazing a DM Matt Mercer is that they're like, oh, I couldn't possibly live up to that, right? And so there's, but I, I love that he's you know finds it instead inspirational, because um, I think that's what it's really you know meant to be. That's like the that's clearly their intent, as opposed to um, let's let us show you how to do it because we're the experts, right? You you go back and you watch season one, those first couple of episodes, one, the sound quality is not great because they're still trying to figure it out. Um, but it's clear that they're, you know, they 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 hadn't played D&D &D specifically. They were kind of modifying it from, from their at-home game. Um, and so they're still kind of, you know, fumbling through some of the rules and, oh, wait, can I do this? And even now, sometimes they're like, um, you know, oh, wait, I thought I got a second attack. Oh, no, that's at the next level, that kind of thing. Um, so, but it really is meant to be just like this fun expression of that. So I have another question before we kind of just continue. And I know I, I've been, I want, I like to hear, I, I'm a teacher at heart. So like, I like to, get, I want the engagement. I don't want just me talking. For those of you who are self-identified critters or you just like critical role, do you watch other things? And have you watched other actual plays besides maybe what Dr. Trammell made you made you watch for this class, perhaps, right? Um, or was it just Critical Role or Bust? I guess is the question. Erin, was immediately wanted to answer this question um, for the thousandth time in this class, and I think everyone can collectively Apologies. eye roll, and I would absolutely accept it because the amount of times I talk about Dimension Twenty is a little absurd. Admittedly, oh, Dimension Twenty is great. <laughs> it's absolutely, it's so wonderful, and I think that it's really cool that like the ways that like Critical Role and Dimension 20 kind of like blend over and like how it shows like like they all kind of like help each other in some ways like I, I just I really enjoy that kind of community aspect of it um the Adventure oh, Zone is one idea. uh Nad Pod there a lot of just like podcasts as well floating around does that count as actual play I was like yes it yeah, does yeah. and then now I'm recognizing okay yeah but um I think that just across the board it's like nice to see people play and then like learn exactly what they're doing because no one knows everything about D&D &D. so like mm -hmm. oh this person just like shape of like water to like or like basically create water to drown a vampire and like stop them from reforming like stuff like that where you'll be like that's a crazy cool idea I want to use that in my campaign yeah. so that kind of, you know, it's it's just generally very fun and I, I love it very much, maybe a little too much. No, I'm with you. Um, but yeah, no, I'm I also very much enjoy Dimension 20. Um, Brendan Lee Mulligan is an amazing DM. I in particular, yes. <laughs> in particular, I think I really kind of gravitated towards them early on when they were still with like college humor, because I kind of liked the edited version of stuff because it made it, it just went a little faster. <laughs> um and sometimes I don't need to hear all the all the different side conversations and stuff. And so I want to just get right into the story. So I, I did appreciate that about them. Um, so yes, you can, you can, I don't know if I'll, if for other classes you've been constantly talking about it, but you will happily, I am happy to listen to you rave about Dimension 20. <laughs> okay, Matthew. Thank you, that is so dangerous. Okay, <laughs> maybe we'll tweet, okay. <laughs> Uh, Matthew, do you want to continue? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I haven't listened to that many. Um, like I've only listened to a little bit of Critical Role. I started listening to Adventure Zone recently because I really love the comics that they came out with. And, like yeah. those, those I love so much. Um, I've listened to Dark Fortunes, which is a smaller one. Um, it's like... Um, 
a TikToker I really liked started playing D and D, um, and so I went to go see that because I really liked his personality and he's really funny. And I love that podcast, though they've gone on high hate on a hiatus for like a year now. So, <laughs> um, and I have been recommended some other ones like Dungeons and Daddies. I've heard that one's good. I've been thinking of uh, listening to that, and also just from the amount of times it's been brought up in this class, I've been thinking of listening to Dimension 20, because I've also seen a lot of, I've always loved co college humor, so. <laughs> you're doing good work, Aaron, you're, and Dr. Trammell, but you're doing good work, Aaron. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, okay, that's awesome, uh, Zafir. Um, yes, apparently you should listen to Dimension 20. Gabriel. Oh, and, um, Oops, so sorry. Ahead. No, you're fine. Heard, um, also, some uh, YouTube animators, uh, this one in particular, Dingo Doodles, they have a few one shots um, that I've listened to and those I love so much as well. I'm not sure if that still counts as actual play or not since it's just one shots and posted yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, they're still playing and you're still watching them play. I mean, it's just like when Critical World does a one shot of Honey Heist, right? That's <laughs> I'm, I'm, oh. maybe I'm like, no, I'm not a purist when it comes to like what, act, what is actual play. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're uh, listening or watching somebody else play D and D or insert RPG here, that's actual play. <laughs> Gabriel. I was also going to say the animators one shots with Dingo Doodles, Puffin Forest, and Z Zbashu. I really enjoyed those. Awesome. Yeah, I'm what so what I'm hearing is yes, you are well versed in other uh <laughs> things, which is good. Um because I think it's good to have a comparison, first of all, and because they're all doing different things well, right? Um and I'm also just always interested in why we watch actual play, just because for some of us it's just because it's funny. Um and for some of us it's the story, and for some of us it's comfort zone. And for some of us, it seems like there are other uh, media that are being created, like the animated clips and other, you know, and fan art and fan fiction and various things like that, that we are also kind of gravitating to, right? The animated series on Amazon, notwithstanding, right? That's a, that's a whole other thing, yes. <laughs> um, so, but I'm, I'm loving that, you know, like you're finding other uh, you know all these different paths and then able to kind of compare contrast see you know like sometimes i'm just not up for a four hour um critical role but some you know something smaller is is um something i can you know, wrap my head around um or just why we do it right so somebody mentioned that their dm likes to watch it for inspiration for their own campaign the first time i dm something it was Curse of Strahd and I was terrified and didn't know what I was gonna do. <laughs> so I listened to Chris Perkins DM Curse of Strahd and listened to a couple others, listened to like a, a podcast out of Australia um, just to kind of see like, wait, how do I do this? Because I've played D&D before. Um, and even when I first started playing, we were listening to a podcast uh, with the, the Penny Arcade guys, um, the very first, very early, it was still only in podcast. It wasn't them, you know, in costume at PAX East and all of this, um, but the very early podcasts where they're wait, where they're like, I want to, I, you know, roll the kill uh, iron tooth. And you're like, that's not how this works. <laughs> that's not how D and D works, but you know, right idea, but not quite the right mechanic. Yes, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Acquisition of the corporate is awesome. Um, but that was that was when when I was first getting started in it. That was one of the first ones out there, um, and that was you know what we had. So I mean, between you know all the ones that we've just mentioned, and and Critical Role certainly has done amazing things for like the resurgence in the popularity of D and D, right? Um, and again, I, I, often I'm saying D and D. And I don't mean to only be exclusive to D and D, right? Um, I think Dr. Trammell has you looking at kind of some other indie RPGs as well. Um, unfortunately, D and D for me has become like when you talk about Kleenex, right? It's like I might not actually be using Kleenex; I might be using puffs, but like <laughs> that's you know it's shorthand. Um, so anyway, um, okay. So so. 
one of the things that we're kind of seeing here and what you all have kind of talked about is not, on, not only critical role or insert podcast actual play here um, that's just only just looking at the show, right? But this proliferation of metadata, right? This proliferation of, of additional things that are out there that are then about the show, right? Um, so summaries and gift sets and stats and um, fan work and fan art and fan fiction and all these meta texts and, and websites and things that are necessary sometimes you know, external to the text itself, but that are collecting and collating and calculating all this other information about Critical Role, right? So we have things like the Critical Role fandom wiki, and we have Critical Role transcripts and Critical Role crit stats, right? Crit Role stats and um, Critical Role translate. And so that has like 30 different languages from, from people around the world, which is such an amazing um, leveraging of of people's talents and people's knowledge um, to help um, you know come together and caption uh, YouTube videos in 30 different languages. Such an amazing work. Um, so when I was starting to look at this uh, and look at Critical Role and um, for my chapter in my book, I was really interested in like, okay, so there's arguably a couple of times that maybe Critical Role and specifically have had some done some things where then there was like fan backlash, right? Or fan, there was, you know, maybe a misstep or maybe a miscommunication or something. And then there was some fan backlash, right? So um, I was really interested in, okay, when that happens, what happens in the fandom, right? Because besides there being an explosion on Twitter of like, how dare they or blah, 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 right? Then when we actually go to these other sites, what, how is that being translated into these other texts, right? So what I was interested in is, are the fans accurately representing critical role um, when in their fan texts, in their meta texts, in their wiki specifically is the one I wanted to look at. Um, when critical role, when the group maybe sometimes does things that is unpopular with the fandom right, or unpopular with the internet is maybe more a better way of saying that because they might not always just be fans um, who are wagging their fingers at things when things happen, right? So like while it's, it's, it's uh, you know, like all of us, we've all just, you know, had an explosion of hearts for, <laughs> for Critical Role and it's often very positively received and again, has done amazing things for the resurgence of D&D, &D, right? Like when there's controversial moments, as there have been, what do the fans do specifically with how do they then present the narrative of critical role? And even as, even as I'm talking about this, I'm realizing just how much I am a English composition teacher because <laughs> I'm realizing that I'm like, they didn't summarize well. <laughs> and that's, you know, like the bulk of what I do in, in, in first year composition, talking about summarizing. Matt, did you have a question? No, sorry. I, it sounded like you were asking us the question. So I was just oh, okay. <laughs> No, that's okay. Well, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Did, uh, if you want to comment, please feel free. I'm happy to shut up. Oh, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Okay. So essentially what I wanted to look at is, um, you know, are they accurately representing the text in their own text, right? Uh, and sometimes what's happening here is, um, you know, the critters have been called by Matt Mercer a juggernaut of positivity, right? But sometimes positivity can be toxic because sometimes we're not necessarily recognizing what uh, is kind of right in front of us or, or not recognizing and acknowledging places where we could do better, right? And so instead we're just like, no, no, everything's fine. Um, that didn't happen. Um, but then that's, you know, dismissive essentially of, well, reality, but it sometimes can just be feel dismissive. So we're trying to just thinking about like, how are we interacting with the text? How are we representing texts when we're talking about them? And so um, one of the things I looked at specifically was um, in one of the episodes uh, in the first campaign, um, Sam Regal uh, changed his character um, a little bit and he introduced the character of Terry and Darrington. Um, and so the characters um, were interacting with Terry, 
and Terry in episode 94 in Jugs and Rods, uh, provocatively titled, um, <laughs> but not meaning that actually, um, revealed that he had, uh, that he had only ever loved uh, his former tutor, Lawrence, um, and that the two of them had uh, been in a compromising position when Terry's father found out, um, and that Terry is having this kind of um, very traumatic experience where his father uh, banished Lawrence. Um, he's worried that he, that his father potentially killed Lawrence. Um, and he has just come out to the group um, as gay. And this had not happened. And, and someone earlier was like, they're, they do such a great job of, of representing inclusivity. They have done that. They really have um, done a really nice job of, of doing that um, but through, through a variety of means. In this particular episode, as in the same 30 minutes of them, of, of Terry, the character, coming out to the group, um, essentially, they, Terry is encouraged or forced to um, hook up with a girl. Um, and so hook up with like the um, Trish the Dish, <laughs> um, the, an NPC character. Um, so Terry seems kind of reluctant to do this and then it's just kind of encouraged um, and he does it. Um, so a lot of critters after this episode happened took to Twitter with um, a lot of concerns. They were concerned about um, what kind of seemed like a, basically a spectacle of trying to convert a gray, gay character um, through the sexual encounter with Trish the Dish. Um, whether consciously or not, that's just how some people interpreted that. Um, so there was, you know, there were some some issues there. Um, so much so that, you know, the cast um, did, you know, come out and talk about it on Twitter. Um, they did not, you know, quote on like fix the mistake or anything. They didn't want it to like be, have it to be this kind of conversion. Um, but Matt Mercer, you know, has a very lengthy tweet about what about um, about the the incident. Um, and so anyways, in the wiki um, for, so the wiki usually very quickly populates after any episodes are, are, uh, are broadcast um, and populate with all this kind of the information like verbatim what's happening and then like um, metadata about it. And like if people, if they then tweet about it like there's like footnotes to the tweets and stuff like that. Um, they're doing, you know, they're very robust. This particular episode went undiscussed this part of it um, for months on the wiki like for six months this this part was just not filled in other episodes kept being filled in and this part was just like empty for a really long time eventually um, some folks finally went to to write about it um, and the summary kind of avoided what was happening so it would say stuff like um, you know, he went off with the the Trish, or like the the Grog and Pike waited around for Terry the, until the next morning, and it's like the next morning of what? What are we talking about? Because it would uh, avoid what had actually happened um, that that Terry had slept with Trish the dish, um, and in, and then eventually it did. I just used the language myself. Eventually, it did say that Terry slept with trish the dish as opposed to which which makes it sound like he is the aggressor that he is the initiator that he is the one who wanted this um when in the episode itself it's pretty clear that that's not the case um uh so so the summary then is not necessarily faithful to the narrative of the show but then is instead trying to paint vox machina and then thus the characters within you know the players within vox machina um in the best light to try to kind of avoid recapping potentially what you know an incident that that did really cause quite a stir on on social media um and so like this was one incident and then like more recently um it, i went back so i i like i wrote about this like two years ago and then you know it got published um but then i just recently went back to look at that just to see like oh did they update it at all and there is more information there but now they're very much playing up the idea that it's that it's shauna the the one of the characters that had initiated this romance between terry and trish mind you trish and Shauna, both like one is a bartender and one is, you know, a guard or whatever, 
both of them are played by Matt Mercer, right? Because they're NPCs. <laughs> so, um, but they've even included fan art that then de de depicts like Trish pushing Terry through the bar, like further like removing Vox Machina for any kind of, you know, um, uh, blame or um, credit here, right? So, so that's one incident that's kind of like questioning. The, another incident that I found on the wiki is um, a fan questioning over when Terry and first got in the group. Um, some of you re might remember, or or maybe you don't know, but like when Terry and first got in the group, there was a scene that was basically Vox Machina kind of hazing Terry and like they beat him up. They they went around. They were like like it it was it was equivocated to to hazing. Um, because they were testing him to see, like, can he actually be part of the group? Um, but it was also partly suggested that, like, the players were really pissed at Sam, who was playing Tarion, because he didn't tell them that he was switching characters and that they were annoyed with him for, for this big reveal. Um, so, um, so somebody on, you know, a commenter on the, the wiki page when in talking about Tarion, um, uh, the 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 description of it had said um, some of Vox Machina decided to test Terry's capabilities by attacking him, and the the wiki editor says, "Should anything be made of this?" I remember watching it and thinking it's an, a low point. To be honestly, this is hazing, right, by the heroes as a requirement to join their group. Um, it is just a game, but I you know I expect them to do better. Is what, what one of the fandom users talked about in their wiki. And then somebody else in the wiki, like a very established um, wiki editor who's you know been there from the beginning and has like a thousand different edits to their credit, um, is kind of like scolding them and being like, um, you know, calm down, it's not that big a deal. It was you know was it ultimately necessary? Like they just had to do this. Um, so he's trying to just basically. Um, uh, point out, you know, like one person is just pointing out, like maybe we this is this really how we should be describing this? Like, this is a bigger deal than that. But the other one is just like, no, like it's not a big deal. Like it, it wasn't that big a deal. Hazing isn't that big of a deal. Um, so there's also there's clearly, you know, where our wiki is supposed to be this collaborative effort of authors, right? And this collaborative um, ability to um, come together to try to uh, um, lost my words, um, narrate <laughs> what is happening here and discuss what's happening in this collaborative writing experience. Um, instead, we're getting this kind of like infighting um, and this disagreement over like, how do we represent what's happening on the show, right? Uh, and probably maybe the last or maybe one of the most, um, uh, one of the bigger issues uh, of the show, how many of you, when I say the phrase Feast of Legends, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Aaron, definitely. <laughs> okay. Okay, awesome. If you don't, you should go to Analog Game Studies and read an awesome essay that I did not write, <laughs> but is there. <laughs> and, and there was an excellent essay on um, the, oh, you had them play it, awesome. Yeah, very cool. Um, yes, so, um, if you go to the Critical Oral Wiki and you look up Feast of Legends, nothing comes up. There is a special named like Special 48. And if somewhere in the meta text, it must say Feast of Legends because it does somehow populate, but the thing is never actually called that. Um, and it's never actually addressed in the Wiki that it says Feast of Legends. Um, and the video is not there, and the YouTube, there's no link to a YouTube video, and it's like it didn't exist, <laughs> um, because uh, it was not well received for, for a variety of reasons, um, and so instead of just saying, this happened, and acknowledging it, and posting it, because clearly, because you can find it, like, if you, if you don't, it's not, you don't even have to go to, like, the dark net to find it, you can find it on the internet, right, but you can't find it on the Critical Role Wiki, unlike every other episode, um, and when you go into, if you do a deep dive into the wiki, which I did for many hours, uh, if you do a deep dive into the wiki to find out 
um, like who's editing it and when they're editing it and all the different edit links. It was there and then it wasn't. Um, and it also, um, they that somebody deleted it entirely and blamed that they couldn't possibly talk about it um, due to a copyright violation. That's what it appears in the log of the uh, wiki that they couldn't show the cases because of a copyright violation, which is not which is not the case. Um, so so yeah. So this. So then, what do we make of all this? This is where I'm finding some subset, and often it is often just a subset, just like any fandom, right? Any fandom that might have toxic anything, whether it's toxic masculinity or toxic positivity, right? There's a subset that is so enamored with and wanting to preserve and present only the good side of a fandom that then they are actually um, denying and dismissing other people within the fandom, first of all, um, and acknowledging what what the reality is, right? What is the canon of the fandom um, and of of the IP? Um, and so this is this is just kind of the this is my weird rabbit hole that I decided to go down for <laughs> for this book to kind of look at like what not only just what is critical role doing, right? But then how are the fans reacting to this, right? Because it's the fans. Who can kind of make and break the show in the sense of like if we if they don't watch if we don't watch then will they you know will they have a multi-million dollar kickstarter that is you know the the sixth highest kickstarter ever right will they have all these things um and i'm not saying they shouldn't and i'm not saying that critical role is bad by any means i really really love it and i really enjoy it um and everybody makes kind of mistakes and everybody makes missteps and they've done an excellent job of addressing those in a, to a to a large extent Right. Um, but then, but the, but sometimes fans think that they're helping by preserving and protecting and only showcasing the very best. And really, it's painting this picture that isn't really there, right? That isn't as positive as it, as it could be. Um, so, all right. So, I'm going to stop and just see if there's any comments or, or thoughts about that. Yeah, Kyle, go for it. Okay. Tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah, so um, I mentioned in the chat, but uh, there was a recent controversial event that Critical went under, which had a lot of people fighting over, which I don't know if it's uh, still a problem, it might still be. Um, but one of the things that they've been dealing with recently is talk over their the intro to their third campaign and the fact that um, it's like a heavy colonist uh, and like maybe a little bit racist and like the fact that it's like, um, what's it called? They're, like their cast is all white and then it yeah. has colonists like, hints and stuff like that yep. um you and i have i actually googled and found the uh, tweet thread if anyone would like to read it i'll put it in the chat um where basically it's the person who's criticizing them and i remember reading this Is when the, the intro came out article uh oh no it, it was the, uh, the uh, list of tweets that i saw oh, okay. when i that first brought this to me if I, I think there is an article on it but i don't know where that there is, is. Exactly. i will i will put that in the in the chat <laughs> yeah um, basically, I remember reading this when the intro first came out, and it was very much so like half of the fan base was like, oh, yeah, they're so wrong. They should take it down, bring back the old intro or like keep the song, but like change the visuals, even though that's like really expensive and really hard to do. Yeah. Um, and then the other uh, half of the fan base was like, oh, they didn't mean it like that. It's supposed to like insinuate ideas like adventure and stuff. It's not supposed to be focused on like the racist part. It's more focused on like exploration and stuff, right. even if it does have like ties because of the historical context behind the clothing they're wearing and things like that right absolutely. um yeah i mean i wanted to bring it up because i kind of wanted to see what people's opinions were on like whether in which direction like is it um how much scrutiny should you put under them because obviously that wasn't their intent but obviously that's something you do need to call out so like what where is the line there in that I, I love it. I, I was, it was on my list of things to bring up. That's why I had the, the article so prominently <laughs> ready. Um, and I just wanted to, the, I was, it was a, want to be the last thing I brought up, but I wanted to stop first. So I'm so glad that you brought it up. And um, I, let's just talk about that for a second. So um, what, what do folks think about that? Like, when do you 
like it's clearly not necessarily their intent, right? But there's clearly something else going on. So are they right to call it out? Do people just like not want the song and they're just, you know, is it the thing where we're calling back like, oh, we love the old song. We love the old intro. Why not just include that? Or what else is possibly going on here, right? Aaron? Yeah, so, um, not be addressing that, but that's okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, I was kind of addressing other things that happened before at CR, if that's okay. Well, well um, I don't know. I'm taking notes, so we'll come back. But, <laughs> yeah, you continue. Um, the ones that stick out to me just in terms of like CR's like, just like the, the fan community's reaction to certain things, like, I think for sure um, what was just mentioned is like a valid thing to bring up as a concern because like if they're, and I think they would want to hear it. Like that's kind of how CR functions. Like if they have, if anyone has a critique, I think that's like the best part about their company that they're so open to criticism and that they like try to fix it no matter what they do. So like the fact that I think that's like a valid concern, but I do think that like two examples where the fan community has definitely been like, maybe a little toxic um <laughs> were specifically the financial one where recently it came out that they're like all technically like millionaires because like they made a huge like media empire like of course they're all millionaires right right but yeah. um and that's the thing like there's no ethical like millionaires in our society and under our government etc so like mm -hmm. it's fair for people to dislike the concept of that but to dislike the people when they already put so much effort into like this medium and they like clearly put their they, they have like a ton of production value so they use that money they need it it makes sense like it's hard to make a show mm -hmm. but everyone was basically like we hate critical role now like not everyone but right, a bunch yeah. of people were basically like criticizing them and getting angry at them for making money right. when they were supporting the company that they enjoyed so it's like so you don't want the company you're supporting to succeed is what i'm hearing right I'm yeah confused. So we liked them better when they were doing it like on a shoestring and a dime and and on a platform that nobody knew about and nobody heard about and and that's died since unfortunately right yeah exactly. yeah yeah totally. yeah it was it was a little ridiculous and like i understand why people like i understood like people being shocked by it because mm -hmm. it is a little shocking to see but isn't it like good to see your money directly helping someone's life instead of being like dang i wish they weren't successful right. <laughs> but um the other one was the issue i think it was mainly on tiktok it was generally also on twitter but there was i think it was a bria's like the a bria's like mid campaign right where there's a character named opal and then someone was like this is a copy of my character named opal because i have a character named that and she looks exactly like it and basically it was implying that she was going to sue critical role mm -hmm. and I, on both sides, I wasn't fond of what, was, of what was going on because first of all, that's ridiculous. Like character is a character, like no one is copying no one in that situation. It was just an accident. Mm -hmm. But secondarily, the way that people responded to the person who was saying this stuff, where it was like toxic internet stuff, pretty basic, like things you expect, but still really upsetting, like things mm -hmm. you don't want to see within like a generally positive community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eric, you put in the chat that you do you, that you want to talk about something that we're talking about oh, right now. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Do. Well, um, as like a complete outsider who never really interacted with CR, like outside of, uh, you know, as Aaron was just saying, like observing Twitter threads, really. Um, it's an interesting case of uh, parasociality going wild and crazy. <laughs> it's uh like the the thought a train of thought that goes from uh millionaires are bad to my favorite streamers are millionaires is honestly like they're not critiquing the system that enables millionaires to do bad things but instead targeting individual people who found success on the internet through their own fan base it was just um yeah like and that they also, then were helping to support because they're yeah like like if if you like okay millionaires are awful but like if you want to change then like you know vote so uh people get taxed more not 
fashion individual people for earning yeah. money like yeah. come on uh or hold them accountable through doing things like charitable things like they oh yeah are, exactly right like they are they do have a, 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 a charity foundation that they are putting uh, efforts into right and not and, just like oh we just give to this one charity because we flubbed up and we needed to they have an entire foundation dedicated to that now and also like the uh, newest campaign controversy yeah as well as the what was it the whole like oh they copied my character thing it's uh i mean like they're they are fans are like recognizing the uh, power dynamics between the uh, giant corporation and well supposedly even like without intense uh, appropriation of uh, minorities individual cultures etc but uh like hmm how should i explain this it's especially weird because the uh conventional like power analysis uh of like just capitalistic power analysis that uh you know defines powers and structures under like monetary and other like social values don't necessarily work here because they are like literally a friend group turned into a uh, like a million dollar enterprise yeah. like so conventional analyses don't work because this is such like a new phenomenon that I don't think like even academics have like seriously considered an analysis in this approach like yeah um yeah that would be interesting doing like an economic study from uh, about this but also maybe other kinds of business models yeah yeah and oh gosh oh what was it? oh yes um and i also feel like the uh critical role became so successful in the first place because of how like well, it feeds very well onto the uh, internet, like parasocialist aspect of like, oh, we're just, you know, friends uh, playing D&D. &D, mm -hmm. And maybe by watching our show, you can join like our virtual friend group as well. Mm -hmm. That kind of idea going on. And this effect is like exacerbated by the fact that the cast is entirely white. Yeah. But, yeah. and, and it's also exacerbated by they feed into that, right? So like now yes. so in, the, in the beginning, they didn't end every episode saying, we love you and we can't wait to see you next time, right? Like they, ab, ab, after, at the end of every episode, they're, they're, they, they, you know, broadcast that, they, they feed off of that parasociality by emphasizing that they love their fans, right? And, and then to try to like get, you know, more fans to kind of cling to that. Similarly, in the video um, that Kyle mentioned about the uh, colonial, you know, the colonialist roots in that, um, in that jingle, in the in the third, um, uh, the the opening scene for the third campaign, critters are directly mentioned, right? Like they're they're talking to critters in that, right? Um, again, kind of feeding back into that parasociality. I can't think of any other kind of opening scene for a show that's not just yes all you critters come join and do, yes exactly thank you kyle <laughs> right it's so i can't think of any other that's calling out the fan base directly like that you know like when uh when i was a kid you know teenage mutant ninja girls didn't talk about you know other you know the people who they didn't call out the people who watched the show and it was integrated into it the only the closest thing i could come up with is something like maybe there's a parallel to like the mickey mouse club I'm trying to think of something else. Or like, like uh, you know, Dora the Explorer, where they're like, oh, what is this? And then they just kind of awkwardly pause for five seconds. Right? Um, but, the, but they're, but the, but are the Dora the Explorer fans called a name? Are they named? Are, are, well, are like group? the effect that they're trying to achieve is like very clearly different. One's for yeah. adolescent children who don't know the boundaries between imaginary and real. Another right. one is fans. 
<laughs> yeah, um, adult fans, well, yeah. presumably adults, but yeah. Yes. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's from like just from an outsider's perspective, the whole critter ordeal has just been a fascinating and also extremely depressing example of uh, how parasocial dynamics have been just so integral to just internet culture and especially their success as content creators. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't feel comfortable about it. Um, it's, it's just not great that they're like actively feeding upon this idea to like enlarge their fan base over the years. And in, a sense like the previously mentioned analyses about like uh, economic and social structure does kind of feed in here as they are essentially uh, well appropriating like need for like emotional companionship back into growing their uh, cultural empire. Yeah. Right. So yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that was way too long. No, you're okay. You're okay. I'm glad you. I'm glad you spoke up because that because that was directly kind of related to what we were talking about. Um, and I, so I want to get to Matthew, and then I don't want to get back to Aaron. Um, but I think a lot of things that we're kind of circling around here is kind of some of this question of intent, because we've talked a lot about oh well like they should still be called out about the colonialism thing but i don't think that was their intent right or like when eric was talking about like uh feeding into the parasociality is that necessarily their intent or is that the happenstance of that and is there a does it matter right so like as a as a right as a, a lit scholar, you know, like that's where my, that's where I'm, you know, got my PhD in comparative literature, you know, we're always told authorial intent doesn't matter, right? It's just the text yeah. that's out there, then it just has to speak for itself, and then we get to you know, pick it apart like the, like the and that we are. <laughs> like, as someone who, like, dabbled into death of the author for, like, two years in high school, it's just going back to that discussion again, uh, okay it's tiring let's yeah. save it for another time i'm sorry okay, okay. moving on you're good uh, matthew what did you want to say um i, I was just uh sharing my the same piece on the critical role and its fandom mm -hmm. pretty much you guys have already said it all <laughs> <That's> um, okay. <laughs> so i did read the article a while back because um someone posted the link in one of our previous uh, Zoom uh, lectures. And it, the author of the article seems to be calling out that specifically it is, while it is never okay to do um, this kind of stuff, it's especially not okay now because they are making so much money. Mm. So they have to be held I, more accountable because of that. Yeah, I, I can understand that because they have the money now they can actually put more effort into it because not everyone like especially smaller companies who don't have that much especially in critical role in their beginning they couldn't spend a ton of money trying to make sure they were um like um trying to do everything the best that they could but they also mentioned in that same article that they did uh that matt did hire people um, to help him make sure that he was representing the mm -hmm. culture as best as he could. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it's difficult to know with intent. Right. Yes, their intent was um, to try and make a very um, accurate and respectful. Um, um, showing of the culture, but at the same time, there's that old saying: the pathway, uh, like the pathway to hell, is paved with good intentions. Right. And so, while they still are, they're, but they're still making mistakes. But that's also just them being human. Everyone's, they're still learning. This is their third campaign. This is a third world, and it's also, I think, the first time that they have had people 
make sure that it was culturally accurate. So it, it's kind of, as long as, from my understanding, for not just critical, but anyone, as long as they're willing to like just keep adjusting and making improvements every single time, mm -hmm. then you can't fault them too much. I'm not saying ignore the bad stuff because right. you, you can't ignore that. And Matthew, that is exact. I, I couldn't agree with you more, right? Because they, because they are doing the thing where they themselves are acknowledging it, right? And they are clearly trying, right? It's the subset of folks who want to just ignore it and, and just be like, no, everything's fine and everything's rosy and not necessarily acknowledge that we all are human and we make missteps and we can we can own up to that and try to correct it right um it's the rose colored glasses of like no that's not a thing that even occurred um that that's what our i take issue with which honestly isn't usually about critical role themselves it's often about this subset of the fandom that just wants to that wants to do this thing like what's happening in the chat right now <laughs> Um, where the poor, where the person who wrote this article received fan harassment because of the article, right? Because that's because, because, because they are so protective of critical role that they will, you know, and and while they can be called a juggernaut of positivity, when somebody's attacking them, they turn into this angry mama bear and not just like trinket, right? <laughs> like like they I are just this angry thing. Yeah, nothing. I think that's more just a comment on fandoms in general because you see it in so many fandoms. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Like one fandom in particular, uh, like the Undertale fandom, there's this uh, very popular YouTuber who sent, who posted a video about the, just like the story that and his, his um, understanding of it. And there was so much backlash on that one video. It's like, it was, worst video that like his number one dislike video it's it's just interesting to see i think it might just be the fact that a lot of people and a lot of fans they integrate what they love into their personality and like you said earlier on like the people who they have difficulty criticizing what they uh, love because they're worried about what that says about them. Yeah, absolutely. So I am restating it what you're saying. Sorry about that. We are. <laughs> but yeah, as a as a, I, I think that's more like and just in going beyond fans to just um, culture in general. Not everyone's open for that self reflection, right? Or from my own experience. Yeah, absolutely. Erin, did you want to say something? Also, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm one of um, the other people in this class. We're in the same room. So oh, okay. we were just kind of discussing as well while you like brought stuff up and we're like, well, you totally agree. <laughs> Drink it. She <laughs> fell in the first. Sorry. Um, but basically what we were kind of discussing is like the parasocial aspect that Eric brought up is really interesting because mm -hmm. um, she brought up basically like a lot of streamers nowadays and like youtubers for example kind of really use that ooh, um as a way to get more like followers of subscribers and they'll be like oh you're like my family and like kind of in a not not like guilt trippy way but almost in like a way of like we're emotionally connected now you have to depend on that yes in a way critical role i would say uses this to their advantage just objectively business-wise it's a business model that helps them and hurts them at the same time so if we're going to criticize them for using it to their advantage we should also understand that technically this is something for the McElroy brothers too these oh, yeah, two definitely. groups of people are super based on like we're good people we make family like oh we're like a family or like we're a group of friends like this is all like this is positivity like we're gonna listen hear you out so yeah. if there's ever like the smallest thing they have to take care of it if like coca-cola had like a tiny thing go on they wouldn't 
care about it. But if Critical Role had something like the Opal situation, for example, then they still take care of it. They still walk everyone through it because they, they, I think they're a really good example of understanding that they use like, they utilize like, hey, I'm like, like we're a group of friends. So you guys are going to feel like you're playing with a group of friends, but we're also going to be held responsible because we care about this group of like this audience that consumes what we produce in like a way that I think I, in my opinion, no person is like, like no one person is going to be like the one person who can say everything for the entire group. But I would say that they do a pretty good job of balancing it in the sense of like, they, they hear it out, but they also have a good enough boundary where like fans will, will kind of respond in a healthier way in most situations, but also it's the internet. Who knows? Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Anything goes. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's, there's a lot of good things happening here, right? So we're talking about like the, 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 how the interconnection of the players themselves right then is feeding into that interconnection with the fan base right um and i like i'm curious about this idea of both um you know it happening definitely with critical role but then also happening with the adventure zone right because you're right they are they are a family and that's you know they were based off of the my brother my brother myself podcast right um so i'm wondering if other because I'm thinking through my Rolodex of, of actual plays in my head and I'm like, you're right. There isn't necessarily ones, other ones haven't gotten as popular, right? Acquisition Incorporated is probably the, you know, one of the top ones as well, but they've also swapped players in and out and are, and don't necessarily have that core because the closest they'll have is the, is the um, friendship um, between the between you know the starters of packs right um, um, Jerry Hawkins and Mike Hulick right so that's the their core and then kind of everybody else is sort of peripheral but even that isn't necessarily as dynamic and presented in such a way on the internet and you know they they don't rely on that as much they're not they're not out there tweeting they're not out there being like oh my god we love you so much thank you for coming to PAX East thank you for coming to PAX West thank you for coming to whatever um it's just it's just very different right Adrian, you want to jump in yeah I mean you kind of just did it with that last part there but Aaron Trammell uh said this to me like a month or two I don't know time soup ago um as like things to think about because I'm everywhere and nowhere uh with like my interests but Aaron was like oh man they're like kind of like a boy band I was like oh my god yeah they really are yeah. um and like how devout their fan base is and like how they market themselves so it's, it's a whole thing yeah crazy man they are yeah no they are they yeah because they have that height around them right. right aaron's so happy <laughs> he's like something i said was like help <laughs> it, it was very thought-provoking Aaron. yeah no it is it's a good comparison it absolutely is but then that makes me yeah you know, like do we then cast the others in in other <laughs> forms. I mean, look, just let me rant about this. Like, yeah, please. The most amazing boy band fact I have is about Mike Nesmith, who passed away this year of the Monkees, who was the the lead singer and guitarist. And Mike Nesmith eventually did a solo career where he wrote all of the songs and was so deep into the music and rock lore that he was like, you know, just like devout into the culture. And yet, he could never get off of him, his reputation, the story that he had been part of this manufactured boy bands in the monkeys. And so even though he was like realer than real, realer than most rock stars were in most of their careers, the world never saw him like that. So just food for thought when we talk about these things, right? Like this, the story is always more complicated than it might seem at first glance. Yeah, definitely. And we won't necessarily, and short of there being, you know, much, you know, more scholarship on this and more deep dives into things like, like, honestly, when I, when I was editing this book and trying to gather people to talk about it, one of the things I had on like the CFP, the call for papers was I wanted somebody to investigate more of the economic side of this 
And I didn't get any articles on that. And I was really disappointed. And that's not my area of expertise by any means, right? Like I can barely do our taxes. <laughs> like so I'm not about to write an in-depth article on the economics of critical role. Um, but I was really curious about that, especially because with all the things like all the different advertisements they do and all the different, you know, like investing that they do. And then like there's, there's the charitable foundations and, but nobody was touching it from a academic point of view, which is really curious to me. Um, so that, you know, like I, I, you're absolutely right, Aaron, that we won't necessarily know, we will never know all of it, obviously, but without more research into it and without more, you know, investigative journalism into it, however you want to spin that, um, these things won't necessarily come to light because there's only so much that Twitter can do. <laughs> but fans have to, you know, like that's why not giving in to the toxic positively spin and the talk and to kind of keep them accountable for these things, like what Kyle was talking about, um, is important. And Kyle, your hand went up like two minutes ago and then you put it down. Do you want to say something? Oh, I was gonna make a note about the the boy band thing that Adriana yeah, brought up. Um because like one of like the things that came to my mind was like you know whenever boy bands either change like the roster of them or try to change the people in their boy band quote unquote a lot of things go wrong for example like oh god i can't remember which band it was but like um who who is it there's a there's an artist who's really popular and who was in a boy band and they split and they got there was a like, controversy when he split oh god my brain's not working but like um that was my like thing that i got drawn to and then it, it made me think of robbie damon who like um not gonna i don't want to spoilers but he joined with third campaign and then sorry uh, I shouldn't say that but yeah um it's been yeah. on the internet Come uh, uh, on. yeah a thing happened it's it's been um, a week you can just say it give the spoiler okay tag. Well, well yeah um spoiler um Robbie Damon leaves the show which is unfortunate because a lot of people wanted him to stay but also at the same time there were people who were like oh yeah no him being added to the crew is just them trying to uh like have a token non-white person basically is what some people were saying and then other people when he left were like saying the opposite like oh my god they're they, they, now it's all white it's only white people and they were all frustrated and I was I, I, that basically that was what it got me thinking of the whole idea of like changing the roster and how much controversy that's been creating right now with Robbie and like yeah. how kind of fitting that is with the boy band analogy funnily enough yeah no yeah. no you're absolutely right and Robbie is not the only example again we will not we will not continue talking about it because people are muting it's okay um, right. Um, it happened 30 something episodes in season one, right? When Orion, sorry, again, spoilers for people who aren't watching season one, uh, when Orion Okabo left, right? And that there was huge controversy around because everybody was like, what happened? What did he, where did he go? And then there was weird talks on the internet about what happened and how he broke up with their friends and blah, blah, blah. And there's like all, you know, like the, a lot of different iterations and versions of that story, right? But there's a canonical character from season one that is no longer there and is not in the Amazon special, right? And, and they refuse to put said character who was in a bunch of those episodes <laughs> um, in, the, in the Amazon, you know, uh, in the Amazon special. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. There is, you know, there's a lot of parallels to other kinds of media, absolutely. Um, and and there's a lot of concerns over what kinds of space have been created, whether intentionally or not, um, for because they all are white, right? <laughs> um, and then and and I and I'm I'm very happy that they are including a lot of guest um, uh, folks um, on the show, and that they're they then purposefully set out to provide other opportunities for other kinds of inclusion within their characters, right? Creating creating gay characters, creating trans characters, it's awesome. Um, but then, you know, but there's still the obvious, right? Matthew? Um, Shelly, I'm, um, I'm gonna stop here. Yeah. We're, we're actually at time. Oh, I didn't know, thank you. <laughs> um, I just got excited talking to your students. I I um I, I usually keep the room open for a little bit after if you want to stick around and continue having these uh, talks I'm I'm down with that by many people might have to go to their class yes, I want to make sure we officially end um before you go first let's all give Shelley uh, or Dr Jones an amazing round of applause this has been such an awesome talk and I learned so much and I can see um, from 
uh, some of the reactions that the, the room seems very excited also. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Jones, is there an email that people can get you at if uh, they want to, to be in touch with you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, you so- can also, You can also just give it to them if anybody wants it. Great. Um, yeah, so you can hit me up if you need Dr. Jones' email, but it's also in chat. It's shelly.jones.phd at gmail.com. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording. So thank you so much.